Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to February's Everyone Has a Voice. I am so happy um, that our features are in the house. We have Teresa Sophia and Lola Bennett, who will be our features today. We have a small open mic, intimate. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Brockton Library and Director Paul Engel for giving us this wonderful space to express our emotions and our poetry. And to the uh, Brockton Cable Access, Mr. Mark Lindy for filming this. Um, this will be great for Lola Bennett, um, who from this day on might be the newest star in Brockton. And, um, <laughs> So we're gonna start off with the open mic, which um, I will start it off. And this is from my new book called um, Light of the Moon. Um, and this is the last poem of the book. It's called Body to Body. I am in the true year of my life and have swum many times but never alone. Mother protects womb, sustenance, knowledge, begins fluid life, draw breath, body to body. Father cradles, small, uncoordinated, arms and legs flail, swallow, panic, breathe. Soothing voice, droplet skim, motion flutters, arise, body to body. Children, buoyant, innocent, laughter echoes, sister warmth, pinching toes, grasp underbelly earth, tickles, amoeba trails, learning to walk, talk, swim. Courtship, salt kisses, tease, electric pulse, hearts pound, skin smooth, passions caress, burning air holds future, body to body. I have yet to swim alone. Rippling tides change with faces of moon, undercurrent pulls, whirlpool spirals, sanity reflects disordered light. Mother, father, whole child, cocoon, connected spirit, tips, fingers, brush, touch still air, outline thoughts, dreams form, hands, cup, moments. Release. Dawn awakens, shedding its night skin. Sun and moon share the sky. Air's grayness mingles and self-belief of origin gives herself to blue, warm silk. Walking, I crawl into womb, leaving amoeba trails. Waiting arms hold, lie across family earth. Fluid life draws breath. I am the embryo of a new day. I swim alone and drift without sound. Breathe out. First on our open mic, Mr. Roger, come on up. Uh, this poem is uh, Fate or Faith. I do not believe I am superstitious, yet illogical thoughts possess me, coveting an object, a trinket. My brother gave me a pocket angel. He was sick with Hodgkin's lymphoma. I've carried it around for years. My brother has been cured. No reoccurrence. The angel coin help? I have never asked. Coincidence? My brother believed it was comforting, kept us close, and sometimes I run my finger over her image, absent-mindedly, or just remembering. An angel coin, polished silver, carried in my pocket. It shines, radiates, a part of me for so long I do not leave the house without 
without it. The feel of this metal pressed against my leg, reminding me to feel positive about life. Life has optimistic turns and challenges to be met unafraid. My brother gave this angel coin to me, a reminder that there is a belief in the familiar ritual, that this talisman leaves me feeling undressed. If not with me, the mirror reveals I am here. The angel feels close, much like my brother's gift, his words of support and comfort. I've since had need to transfer the angel's power of, of support. Kidney failure, dialysis, transplant. In, in a shamanistic way, she is the goddess, a present for, for meditating as though old friends. We know not of each other and yet would be lost without the other. A pocket angel, shiny and bright, Nancy went to Atlantic City, brought me back a wish coin. Good for one wish. I have not used it yet. It accompanies the angel. I have a goddess and a wish. It's about belief in people who care, people that connect. Thank you. Mr. Roger Boucher, thank you for your words. Um, it is an honor to introduce the next poet on the open mic. Um, she has a new book out, Threads of Fire, um, Nancy Brady Cunningham, um, was, has been a long time poet. Um, she gave me my start many years ago at the uh, Blackthorn Tavern in Easton, um, where she ran the venue there saw something in me and gave me my first feature. So uh, hopefully uh, come June, um, I can reciprocate and give her her feature for her new book. Please welcome Nancy Brady Cunningham. How's that sound? Okay, yeah. Oh, Phil, you did great. It was in 95 or 96 that Phil came in and read for the first time. And here we are, perfect. So I'm going to read um, from Thread of Fire. Poems of Peril, Longing, and Loss. So this first that I'll read is called Playing the Horses, First Encounter. So, a little background. Um, I grew up in a housing project in Rhode Island called Prospect Heights, and right near us was a racetrack, Narragansett Racetrack, out on Route 1, Newport Ave. So, um, in this poem, I'm 13, and um, of course, the parents had said to a 13-year-old girl, no boys, no cars, and don't go to the track. I was not the most obedient. <laughs> Playing the horses, first encounter. Back door closes and closes, march wind blusters against asphalt. He keeps his motor running at the edge of the heights. She spots his powder blue Ford, continental kit shining on lowered rear chassis. 
He leans across, pushes door wide. She slides into Hot Break Hotel, smoldering from the dash. No boys, no cars, no track beats a counter rhythm in her mind. At the red light, she slouches down. A gaggle of girls from her grade keeps within the crosswalk lines straight as the nuns from St. Teresa's. He's off to slap. 20 on a hot one, shouldering into the shiftless crowd, waving greasy bills, yelling at cigar-chewing cashier. Her sideways glances search for wavy-brimmed hats, paisley ascots, jubilant roses strung together in a necklace, winner take all. Afternoon light diminishes, racing forms litter the ground. He peels out onto Route 1, exhausting her MGM dreams. The project looms red brick sameness glowering in a setting sun. Again, he parks on the outskirts. Scent of aqua velva closes in. Lips skim hers, heat lightning flashes beneath flared skirt. Her insides twist this way only when she sits close to Paladin. His Friday night kisses blazing through a black and white TV, touching her secret place where smell of blood fear now mingles with steamy car windows. No have gun will travel here. Only one hand reaching for the cold metal handle, he murmurs stay, tugs at her coat. His sweet hurricane kisses press against supper, dark, home. She leans away, door opens out. She takes the slow, long road. She burns through icy wind. And the second one I'm going to read is a totally different subject. And it's for um, a friend of mine who had breast cancer and passed away um, at age 44. So, it's coming up. I helped take care of her toward the end, and this is to a friend showering. You wipe away the gloss and the blush, lean your spine into an evaporated spray, your nightshirt hangs on a porcelain hook, one breast pocket stitched, one knot. Flakes of glitter polish cling to your nails. You pull aside the plastic curtain, blurt of grafted skin framed in the mirror. I watch you clutch at a frayed towel. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. So we're gonna go right into our features. And um, start off with our student feature, Lola Bennett. And I first met Lola at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, she shared her poetry with me, 
And as she was sharing it, I was enamored with every word she was saying. And I couldn't believe that um, this mature girl at the age of 13 was um, giving me this poetry. And I thought to myself, I want to be like Lola when I grow up. <laughs> So, we'll do a little bio on Lola. Lola Sophia Bennett is a Dominican and French Canadian, age 13. Started writing poetry more often due to a girls' group at the Boys and Girls Club of Brockton called Female Friday. Female Friday was a time we used to talk about our feelings and emotions, and we could often write poetry to help express our emotions. Even after the group ended, I continued to write poetry because I found it easier to write poetry than to write in a diary or journal. It is also easy for me to write poetry because I love music and it makes me feel like I am writing a song about my life and feelings. And it makes me feel like I am sharing my poetry with my family, especially my sister because she writes and reads poetry as well. My family encourages me to write and share my poetry. I hope you enjoy my poetry as much as my family and I do. Please welcome Lola Sophia Bennett. Hello, is this good enough? Um, so my first two poems are but the poems that I'm going to be reading are, like the poetry before, quite different from each other. The first one is called Best Friend, and it's based off of like me and my best friend who've been together for nine years. And even after I moved, we stayed in contact with each other, and I just thought it was a very important relationship to withhold. So here it goes. You're the easiest person to talk to, no matter how far my brain has gone to. Whether I'm down on my knees hugging, when I'm down on the ground hugging my knees, or singing and jumping high in the trees. I don't expect you to stay here forever. That's for you to decide. But if you choose to stay to help me keep away the scary hate or the banging on the walls of my mind of all the words of the cruel outside world, I would swirl and twirl as we hold hands and walk down the never-ending road of stone path with bare feet, arm in arm, soul to soul, smiles reaching for our eyes forever and ever for, and always. I know you'll be there, my best friend. That's my first one. <laughs> my second one is called Soldier. And <clears throat> I based it off of a meeting we were having at the Boys and Girls Club with one of the staff. And he was asking, it was like boys versus girls, and we were talking about how guys treat girls and like whether in relationships or just in general and how girls treat guys and why we act this way. And it just got me thinking about like people in general and how people treat each other, but how people still act. So this is Soldier. <laughs> Talking wreck for no reason. I'm a walking soldier. I don't care if I'm bleeding. Death isn't a thing that I fear. It's nothing worse than talking to you, demons. But I fear the words you can do to my living body. Ugly, fat, stupid. Words that work even if the shoe doesn't fit. You could walk around in designer clothes, but the true colors will always show. There is no such thing as pure white snow. Now, I'm not promising that I can fix it, but hopefully what's coming from my mouth can bring this evil to its limits. Now, you could say anything you want behind my back. Talk trash and let the number of wounds stack. But, from, but front will stand, stall, will stand tall because my dream world will never let me fall, even with its cracks and rigid groves, grooves. But I will always remember that I am me and I am a part of this world, even if you don't think so.
Miss Lola Bennett. Paul's expertise. Okay. So, Miss Lola Bennett. Wonderful. We go right to our next feature, Teresa Sophia, is a Haitian American poet with long wiry, sometimes untamed locks in a 90s personal style. Teresa is reminiscent of the essence of the spoken word, the raw, the real, the unapologetic. Teresa began showing strength in writing at a young age. She wrote short stories, songs, and poems and began performing all across her home state during undergrad, receiving a master's degree from the University of Miami. Teresa Sophia the poet became the rapper. The shift in the genre would expand her audience and introduce them to Teresa's ability to connect them at all levels. She is the executive director of her own nonprofit, What's On Your Mind Incorporated, which works to converse around mental health. Please welcome Teresa Sophia. So I don't need a mic, I'm very loud. Um, I just want to know, Mark, if the mic will pick me up if I stand right here. Kind of, so I should stand back here. Okay. Um, so I have two poems, possibly three, planned for you guys. Um, the first poem, is since it's Black History Month, I wrote this poem last year. I had um, someone on Twitter ask me why I love being black. I think I tweeted something like, I love being black, and then someone responded to me, why do you love being black? And I really had to sit down and think about it, and it actually inspired me to write this poem, and this is the outcome of that. So this is called, Why I Love Being Black. She asked me why I love being black. I said everything. The way oil touches my skin and it glistens. I love that my hair is magic and defies gravity. I love reading about all the movements we start on blavity. I love that we never sit still and always fight back. I love that we always got a vicious clap back. I love a full beard and a fresh snap back. No one ever can do it better than West Indian women in the kitchen. Are you hungry means I love you. Our language is our own. You my nigga, you my zo, you my homie. Got love for everybody, but black people know me. Got hundreds of cousins and they all ain't blood because when you're black, it doesn't matter if you're related. It's all about love. We the best hype men. Yes, sis, I see you slaying. Our intellect, the way we get it popping. We the rolls through the concrete, the David to the Goliath. Think you can hold us down? Try us. I love being black because we stay winning. Thank you. So my next piece is very similar to Lola's second piece. Um, I feel like as a millennial, we get messaging from all over the place about how we, wish, how we should look. Um, and we're living in a time where women are constantly changing their bodies via surgery or pills or whatever have you um, because they feel like they need to conform to how society views themselves. And um, so for a very long time, I've struggled internally about my external features, and this poem is about that. I will not conform to your standards of beauty. My breasts aren't the biggest, waist not the thinnest. I am not your Barbie. You can't Nicki Minaj me. You can't one size fits all me. All these girls want to be Kim Kardashian clones on the phone with Dr. Miami to get that new silicone. The media and these trolls trying to convince me that the way I look isn't OK, but I know my God makes no mistakes. 
He carved me with a scalpel from the heavens, rubbed me down in all this melanin, called on Marie to give me birth. I think my mother is the most beautiful woman on this earth. I was made in her image, so call me by my name, saggy tits, gap teeth, ugly. I am woman and I will not be shamed. I am woman and I will not be shamed. I am woman and I will not be shamed. Hell no, I will die for ass shots or break the bank to get what this other woman got. I'm okay with me. If you're not, it shows your insecurities. Somewhere, someone in this world is begging for what you got. So. Hold on tightly to what you got. Excuse me, but I don't need to look like every Instagram thought to know I am beautiful. I know I am beautiful, and so are you, and you, and you, and you. Society can't dictate what I see. I got two eyes, and with these contacts, my vision is 2020. And if you don't see what I see in you, your eyes are telling you lies. There's no way you should compare yourself to a girl that's been dipped in airbrush, dragged in contrast, and dropped in a beat from the gods. Comparison is a killer. Don't push him. Beauty comes in all shapes, sizes, colors, and forms. Mine is mine and yours is yours. There is no need to conform. We were born. We were chosen. Know that inside and out, you are golden. Thank you. And that's all I have for you guys. Did you, I could do one more, but it has a lot of swears in it. Is that okay? Is that okay? I want to ask your permission first before I say a ton of F-bombs. Okay, so this poem is called No More Fuckboys. And for those that don't know, a fuckboy is someone who does not have your best interests at heart and takes advantage of you and manipulates you. So um, a few years ago, I think as an artist, a lot of our art comes from a place of pain or growth and learning. Um, so this is a few years ago. My mindset is so different now. Um, but Oftentimes when I perform this piece, I usually perform in front of um, like the millennial crowds and they'll say that like, I'm so happy you performed this. Um, I needed this in this moment. So hopefully you guys get something from it too. And I apologize for the child in the room. So it's called No More Fuck Boys. I was told there were plenty of fish in the sea, so I did as I do when I'm feeling lonely and went fishing in hopes that I'd catch the right fish for me. At first encounter, he appeared to be everything I felt my future husband would be. Tall, handsome, had a couple degrees, everything I felt would be the perfect fit for my cookie cutter dreams and aspirations. This desire of finding a boyfriend became an infatuation, even though he slowly started revealing himself. Peeling back his costume, jumping in and out of character like an actor after the director yells cut during a gut-wrenching climax scene, then walking to his chair, smile on, demeanor so serene, I turned a blind eye to this Jekyll and Hyde. Made excuses for his behavior. Thought I was being paranoid because I've been hurt a few times before. Thought that heartlessness in a man was a rarity and I just had a few bad encounters and it wouldn't happen anymore, but it was happening again. Each time after an argument when he was ready to say, let's just be friends, it happened every time I would call his number for hours and he would text me back telling me his phone had been dead or left somewhere. It happened every time I would ask him a question, he would deflect and put it all back on me. It happened every time he claimed to be into the same things that I was into, but when the topic came up, the conversation never got that deep. Meanwhile, he was quick to get deep inside me. Although it was in a subtle way, he brought it up every time we touched and kissed, even though I made it clear that I had wanted to wait. He made me feel beautiful. He made me feel intelligent. He told me shit that I already knew, but it was a more significant form of validation coming from the mouth of this dude. I let the fun, the good times, and this desire cloud my judgment. I was waiting, searching for something greater to be the reason I let him go. All of the small shit I questioned, but I swept out of the door, and inevitably it came. 
Although I cried crazy tears, thought about each way I could get him back, infuriated because I told him about all the hurt that I encountered in the past, manipulated me and did that same shit. I wanted to flip his shit, blow up everybody's DMs exposing his fuckboyness. But then I realized he was a fuckboy, but I let him be. I let the fuck boy take control of my emotions so I could feel complete. I let him in, commit sins on my mind and my body. I was naive, but I wasn't numb because I could feel every knife he stuck into me. I wasn't strong enough to let him go. The moment I felt uneasy because I'd rather be with the fuck boy than start all over again or worse, be alone. He wasn't the only one with issues. I was a fuck girl because I let the fuck boy fuck with me. And in this fucked up world, men don't always have your best interests at heart, baby girl. They'll look you in your eyes, lie dagger in fists, and go straight for your heart. But you can protect it. Wise up and tell them apart, make them earn it, learn discernment and follow your intuition. It's God's way of spitting facts, dropping knowledge and protecting you. Even though as women we are conditioned into thinking that having a man next to us is the next position for completing our lives, a liar is a liar. You can choose not to be his fool. Remember, you are great without a him because you have a him. So please learn from my mistakes. And don't let these fuck boys in. <laughs> Thank you. This is 2019. This is not your grandfather's poetry. <laughs> this is not roses are red or violets are blue or how do I love thee, let me count the ways. This is real poetry and we thank Teresa and we thank Lola for coming today and sharing their emotions with us. And we also like to thank Roger Boucher, Nancy Brady Cunningham, but we especially want to thank everybody who came to listen. That's the most important thing. Wherever you go, please listen. We'll be back March 16th with Marlon Carey as your feature. Thank you very much and have a great day.